So, thank you very much for Sophie for inviting me to come and talk today. Um, I'm sort of filling in for someone, so I hope that my talk is at least mildly as interesting as theirs would have been on a different link and get it channel. Um, before I start, um, I'll just kind of very briefly say that um, having heard a few folks say, oh, you do something other than animal models, yes, at Charles Ruber do other stuff as well. So I'm from the early discovery department and some of my colleagues are in the audience as well. So we, we do quite a lot of in vitro assays and uh, we can help drug discovery projects at different stages and also very different scales. So yes, we do run the big primary screens and, and long-term projects, but we also do you know, smaller scale stuff and, and have um, contributed to some publications. I think most recently was uh, University of Heidelberg with their NMDA stuff in, um, in science. So the talk today, um, back to venoms. It's, it's, uh, venoms and toxins has been the topic of the day. And I think for, for us, um, we did this together with um, Venomtech. So they're a sort of, um, company down in Sandwich in Kent that specialize in, in making uh, venom fractions and, and toxins for drug discovery. Um, for us, we had kind of two aims for the experiment. One was to try and identify some possible novel toxins or mechanisms of action for known toxins for uh, NMB 1.4 and 1.7. So when Venom Tech are collaborating with someone who's found evidence of um, you know, administering toxins whereby people with muscle conditions relating to NAV 1.4 may see benefits from getting these toxins. But at the same time, they experience pain, right? Which then links to NAV 1.7. So that's the rationale for the two sodium channels that we're looking at. From our perspective, from, from um, my group at, at Charles River Early Discovery, what we wanted to see is how easily could we plug in something like this into an established drug discovery cascade with high throughput automated patch clamp. Um, and I hope that by the end of the talk you'll, you'll kind of agree with me that it's really quite straightforward. Um, we can generate some, some pretty cool data. Uh, venoms we've already talked about, I don't, I don't really need to uh, dwell on the rationale for those again. Um, venom tech I mentioned, they are um, ex-Pfizer sandwich folks, um, my ex-colleagues. Um, Steve Trim um, started the company and is one of these crazy snake guys. <laughs> um, I visited their lab, it's, depending on your views, a cool or scary place. Um, so they, they, they provide the venoms, um, and I'll show a little bit more about what they do and how they provided those venom fractions to us, but I won't dwell on it too much. 1.7 and 1.4 we already touched on, and, and it kind of links to the two publications at the bottom there, where there are reported um, cases of spider bites where people get muscle spasms but also pain. Uh, one of those papers, does the, the first paragraph essentially is about someone in the 1600s poking themselves with a, with a sharp stick and then putting the same sharp stick against a spider fang and poking themselves again. So, you know, kudos to everyone who's, who's you know, helped us with <laughs> venoms. Uh, madness. So, just very briefly on the materials and methods, what do we do? Uh, pictures of spiders, apologies. Um, the first part of, of the whole study was the design of the library. So what Venomtech do is they use their expertise in both the animals but also uh, knowledge about toxins and venoms for, for designing a library. It's not a random selection of venoms, it's rationally designed. Then they uh, fractionate the venoms uh, and basically provide those venom fractions, in our case, in a multi-well plate, 384 well uh, plate, lyophilized. Uh, ready to um, basically dilute with your extracellular buffer and just put onto your uh, system as, as, as required. Um, they've got a pretty sophisticated fractionation method now, so effectively in each fraction you're looking at one to three toxins, so one to three peptides, so it's, it's really fairly well refined. We then generated the data on our Sophian Cube system, first in a, a single point kind of pilot screen, and then anything interesting, we followed up with concentration response curves, and then Venom detected the hit ID with mass spec, so we kind of know the peptide sequences. A uh, few more spider pictures, apologies. Um, Venom detected the prediction, 
again, we're looking at inhibitor um, cysteine knots. Um, based on their information, they selected some tarantula species and then um, milked the spiders in the same way as, as described before with CO2 um, uh, and, and then uh, safely milking the spiders and putting them back in their homes. Um, this is a uh, kind of snapshot from the article from, from Steve and Carol Trim, um, just kind of indicating their in-depth knowledge on, on all the different kinds of peptide toxins that you could look at for modulating not just ion channels, but overall uh, function of nerves. Um, this was already shown earlier by, by Dr. Maller, so I won't dwell on it too much, but yes, we know a lot of places where toxins bind and, and they have been instrumental in elucidating the kind of structure and function of um, sodium channels. Um, I'll just skip straight on in the interest of time. Uh, just to kind of orient everyone, now we're kind of moving into the electrophysiology data. Um, what I'm showing here is basically the kind of cube protocol that we used. So if you didn't have a look at the big black box upstairs, that's what we have. It's based on 384 well plates, so all wells get the same protocol applied. Um, this is kind of our uh, voltage and experimental protocol. Be before this point, we've already gone wholesale, um, and, and this is then applied to wholesales. We have a couple of blocks here where effectively we're just applying a very simple uh, uh, sort of, uh, test pulse. We're allowing the cells to settle, the seals develop during this time. Then we run an online Boltzmann um, um, experimental block, so we apply these voltages, uh, determine the V-half of inactivation for each well, and that value is then applied in our kind of compound testing voltage protocol. So we have a, a very quick resting state test pulse. We apply the V-half of inactivation per well, then we have an inactivated state test pulse and a, and a recovery from inactivation test pulse after that. For this talk, I'm just talking about the, the resting state, but the state dependence data is there to be mined. We then apply um, just vehicle, which is our extracellular buffer uh, with some pleuronic acid, um, and then we apply uh, the venom fractions and then a full block period as well that we can normalize to. So that's, that's the basis of the, the data I'll start showing. First of all, just a little bit of uh, kind of reference compound data to show you the kinds of current traces that we're recording. So we have um, either uh, Navon point um, 4, Navon point 7, with our vehicle uh, currents in blue, and then either TTX as our inhibitor control uh, or ATX2 as our activator control. Um, we're using these two, so we're using something as closely resembling the test articles as possible. So you can see here, um, TTX is pretty much fully blocking the currents as expected, and ATX2 is showing this kind of fairly well-known change in the inactivation and also increase in peak current uh, in some cases. All right, then a lot, of, a lot of data here, but I'll kind of walk through this. So. As I mentioned, we first tested about 960 venom fractions in single point over two experimental days. These plots effectively show the data from day one versus day two, indicating that the assays were pretty robust and, and any activity that we observed, um, we could see most of the time on both days. Um, you've got the sort of line of unity there showing correlation and the dashed lines show the kind of variability of the vehicle controls as an indication of the, the, the assay uh, robustness and anything within those dashed lines we would consider a hit. We looked at the resting peak current, but we also looked at the resting area under curve as a sort of catch-all parameter for either changes in inactivation uh, or, or basically peak current. So we could then drill down and look at some of those that infractions in more detail uh, to check what they were doing. And then I'm just showing in the middle here a couple of examples of those venom fractions. So here in blue, in both cases, we have our vehicle control. And then from the same well, the venom fraction. So you can see in this top graph here, we're observing a difference in an activation, a little bit similar to, to what Arena presented. So we're not seeing the change in an activation all the way from the peak, but a little bit later on. And in the graph here at the bottom, we're seeing inhibition by this particular venom fraction. So what did we find? 
we found a mixture of things. This first uh, example here is a non-selective activator of both NAV 1.4 and NAV 1.7. So in each of these panels, we're first showing basically the current um, at, with vehicle, and then our application of the venom fraction, and then our full block. So you can see in all cases here, basically we're seeing an increase same magnitude approximately in both NAV 1.4 and NAV 1.7. Uh, we also found some non-selective inhibitors. Um, so again, looking at the vehicle period, and the current is reduced, and then the full block completely takes away the current. So there's a little bit of a difference in the magnitude of the, of, of the block between the two channels, but effectively we would consider the full inhibition in both cases. But we also, interestingly, saw something that starts to show selectivity straight away from the raw venom fractions with you know, effectively no modification. So here in the top panels, we're seeing approximately you know, 50, 20 percent of the NAV 1.4 current being inhibited, whereas it's taken away completely by in the NAV 1.7 recordings. So there's already some indication of possible selectivity. And I think, that, you know, linking back to one of the questions that was asked of, of Irina about why would you want to look for activators? Well, in some cases, it may be useful to activate a sodium channel, but then you will have to be able to do it selectively. So that's, that's the rationale also for looking at activators. Um, so just kind of a little bit about the assay quality. Each of the plates that we ran, they had... Uh, the, our vehicle controls, um, our ATX2 TTX controls, and then this is just kind of showing the, the assay quality with our um, TTX concentration response curve. So you're looking here uh, two days uh, for both NAV 1.4 and NAV 1.7 overlaid, um, and it's looking pretty good. Very consistent data. We were happy with this. Um, we then picked the most interesting venom fractions from that single point screen and then repeated them um, as concentration response curves. So again, I'm showing here data for either NAV 1.4 or NAV 1.7 from two experimental days. And you can see um, for some of these, we're already observing a little bit of selectivity also in terms of potency. So interesting starting points to maybe start modulating, changing those peptide sequences and, and tweaking them a little bit. Um, so we saw both uh, inhibitors with some selectivity coming in. For the activators, um, also here, it looks like maybe we're activating NAV 1.7 a little bit more and, and NAV 1.4 not so much. So again, this sort of selectivity is starting to come in a little bit. At the, up to this point, we been doing the work blind. We didn't know the identities of any of these venom fractions. Um, we basically just delivered them the, the well identifiers to Venom Tech, who went away and um, did their uh, mass spec. And what we got out of this was um, interesting from the perspective that there was some novelty. So uh, we found a new tarantula toxin. Um, that hadn't been reported before, uh, modulating NAV 1.7. Um, and then we also found some novel activity for known tarantula toxins. So from a, just kind of very briefly going to my summary, um, we tested 960 venom fractions. We identified about 33 of those as hits. So it's approximately 3%, which, uh, just to put that into context, when we typically run ion channel screens, either you know, the resonance-based or automatic patch clamp, our assumed hit rate is somewhere below 1%. Uh, so that speaks to the rational selection of these tarantula species and the venoms that we were able to have a, what you could call as an enriched um, source material. Um, 26 of those fractions were confirmed in the, in the concentration response profiling um, step. Um, most of them were, were selected for NAV 1.7 and out of this we've identified um, 
five novel tarantula toxins. Um, and I suppose the, the rationale for us doing this with automated patch clamp, um, all that data was generated within four experimental days. Uh, roughly the same time for the analysis, but to give you an idea of how quickly we can put together a data package like that. Um, as a follow-on, we're now looking in more detail um, into those uh, uh, new uh, toxins that were identified and, and, and we'll see what we can do with them um, with, with some uh, further work. We'll probably look at the panel of sodium channels and, and we can also start looking at some of the uh, other um, possible known players. Okay, just to acknowledge the people who deserve the credit, I'm, I'm here just the figurehead. So uh, the work was done by Elaine. She's now gone on to do a PhD in Glasgow. Um, Stephen, uh, he was a placement student with us from, from University of Bath, and he's gone back to, to finish his studies there. Um, Danielle did most of the work at Venom Tech, um, so she, she provided us with the plates. Um, yeah. Happy to take questions, and uh, if it's interesting, please do get in touch. Great, thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Time for questions. Damien? Nice talk, Yuha. Um, I'll get a little bit nerdy and technical. Um, the lyophilized li fractions, I think you said they were, and, and these are obviously stamped into your 384. Presumably that lyophilization is both a nice stable format, but also it, it readily solubilizes. Yes, yeah, okay. we didn't see any issues. Sorry, that was the, the best I could do. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's all right. What we have found is that you do need to use things like pleuronic acid with peptides that, that will stabilize them and keep them active for, for some time. Anything further? Yeah, I actually have. Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, a little bit about the follow up on Damien here. I mean, peptides tend to be, I mean, you, you talked about a little bit yourself, but they tend to sort of inactivate with time now. I mean, ATX2, for example, I mean, you can't keep in solution very long. So, I mean, how much problem do you think that was, or is, or? It, we've, with using something like pleuronic acid, um, we've actually been able to stack these compound plates for hours on the system and just run them overnight, and ATX2 will remain active. I'm impressed. Good. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.